Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Min Ji Yun. I'm fourth year PhD student in computer science department, working with Roslan, the instructor of this class, and Christos Fallosus. So my research area is in graph neural network. That's why today I was invited here to give a guest lecture about graph neural network. So today I'm gonna talk, introduce the concept of graph neural network and how it works. And I'm gonna highlight a few interesting open research questions like discussed actively, actively right now in, uh, in the field. And then like, if you haven't choose like your course project, maybe you can get idea from this lecture. So before talking about the graph neural network, we need to first ask a principal question, what is a graph? So a graph is composed of individual data entity, which will be presented as node in a graph. And relationship between those individual entity as edges in the graph. And this graph structure should be presented in a fixed like form because we could not just hand over this drawing to the computers. So how we usually present the graph is in the adjusted matrix form. So you uh, list the list the, you like list the nodes on the row and column. And if two nodes are connected, for example, if A and B are connected uh, in B A and A B uh, index, you will put one. It, if they are not connected, you're going to put zero. So by doing that, the adjusted matrix could represent the graph structure. And usually in real world, a graph is coming with node attributes. So think about like social network. Uh, in Instagram, each users are node. And if I follow you or if you follow me, we're going to have edge between us. And, and each user have its own information, like profile or the tags I usually use to upload my photos or location where I uploaded my photos. And that's going to be the my specific information. So that will be the attribute of each node. And when we are given a graph in real world, we assume we can have access to attribute to each node. And this node attribute will be given to us as form of feature matrix. So this is a matrix, just concatenation of the node features of each node. So remember, when I uh, we're given a graph, that means we're given a jersey matrix and node attribute matrix. And this form of graph, one type of data modality, but these graphs are literally everywhere in our real life. From the social network, this is Facebook network a few years ago, where if you went more to your friends, you can have transaction network between you guys. And even like uh, there are many graphs in human constructed systems, like ground transformation uh, system, you can present as a graph. Each station will be nodes and the two, two, uh, two line between station will be edge in the graph. And even in our bodies, there are many graphs. For example, in brain, neurons are how neurons are connected or communicate with each other could be presented as a graph and the molecule the basic unit used in chemistry and biology could be also presented as a graph format. And because graphs are everywhere, if you make a good graph model, that means there are diverse array of application you can uh, bring a huge impact on. So graph neural network recent uh, become a like ground uh, breaking research in graph, uh, graph deep learning model. And then, it bring a huge impact on diverse application. Pinterest, Amazon, Uber, like Google, they all use graph neural network to make a better recommendation. Uber, you, uh, like Uber it's use graph neural network to pre, uh, recommend you the next food you are likely to order. And Amazon use graph neural network to make a better recommendation, which product you're gonna buy next. And Google, they also use graph neural network to uh, improve the travel time prediction. And beyond this recommendation application, graph neural network are actually be actively used in other science fields, from reinforcement learning in computer science fields, chemistry, material science, biology, and even like used in the uh, design chip in a fast mode. And recently people start to find a connected dot between graph neural network to mathematics. And now GNN are also actively used in, uh, to solve combinatorial optimization. 
So graph neural nets are not just like showing its impact in application level. Actually, it's a very hot research topic right now. In iClear 2021, all, among all papers which are accepted and rejected, the most frequent keyword they use. The fourth one is graph neural network, followed by three abstract keywords like deep learning, representation learning, representation, uh, reinforcement learning. And also before pandemic, when NeuroIPS was held offline, the second biggest workshop was graph representation learning, which had more than 1,300 attendees. And this is not just a temporal hype. As you can see, graph neural networks show the fastest growing speed across all topics in deep learning right now. So what is graph neural network? Why it could bring this much power across various applications and why researchers put this much attention on this topic? So today we're gonna to learn about this graph neural network. So the problem definition that graph neural network want to solve is like this. The input is graph adjusted matrix I described before. Node attribute, node attribute matrix, what I described before. And a part of nodes will be labeled. And what graph neural network try to do is find good node embeddings representing its node like properties. And using those node embeddings, application uh, will uh, predict labels for the unlabeled node. And what is like good node embeddings? We say the goal of the graph neural network is finding good node embeddings. And what graph neural network think, like what uh, good node embedding is, they think uh, there is a homophily in graph, which is connected nodes are related, informative, or similar. So that means we are not, I'm not just looking into my own information, but I'm gonna refer my neighboring node information because they must be relevant, informative, uh, similar to me. So by using their information, I can make better node embedding for me. So what they do is, oh, I'm gonna aggregate messages from the neighboring node. And I'm not just like looking into my direct neighbor. Maybe neighbors of neighbors will be informative for me. So I'm gonna aggregate information from neighbors from neighbors too. And what they, what graph neural network finally do is, we want to summarize the graph structure around me and their node attribute. And we want to map them into a fixed size form. And this fixed size node embedding will be used in diverse application. It could be used as a friend's recommendation in like Instagram, Twitter, and product recommendation in Amazon, fraud detection, or churn prediction in transaction network and banking systems. So let's look into how exactly graph neural network uh, refer their neighboring node. So two compute, let's say our target node is XA. We want to find good node embedding for the XA, uh, the node A. And to do that, we're gonna refer to embeddings of BCD. And our next question is, okay, then what is the embedding for the BCD? And to compute the BCD embedding, we're gonna look into their own neighbors. So that at the end, the A node embedding will contain all information uh, appear in this tree, tree structure graph. So we're gonna call the leftmost part as zeros layer, and we uh, use their node attribute, the input attribute we are given. And then we aggregate them, and then we make the first, uh, node, first layer node embedding for the node appear in this uh, second layer. And then we aggregate the first layer node embedding to finally compute the node embedding for the node A. So how exactly it aggregate and what is this gray neural network form? We're gonna talk about it now. So it, what happened in this, there are two operations. First operation is aggregation operation. So let's say H3L is node embedding of V at L layer and NV is neighboring node of V. So here, when I ask NA, it denotes BCD, it's neighboring node. And then FL is aggregation function at the L layer. And this aggregation function will receive the target node embedding and it's neighboring node embedding. So for A, the neighboring node are BCD. So the input for this aggregation function will be HAL 
HDL, HCL, and HDL. And the output of this aggregation function will be message vector aggregated toward the target node V at the else layer. And in the second operation, in the transformation operation, what happened is using this message vector, we're going to transform. And then we use this transform embedding as the new node embedding for the target node A. So each aggregation part is composed of two operation, aggregation operation and transformation operation. So look, let's go back to the original graph. So here, what have for each layer and for each target node appeared here, they're gonna do two operation, aggregation operation and transformation operation. And as you can see at the beginning, uh, the generous layer embedding will be the node attribute which are given to us. And then we will keep uh, update the node embeddings. So the takeaway from this part is graph neural network is composed of several layers and each layer you're gonna do run two operations. First is aggregation operation. Second is transformation operation. And now our follow-up question is, okay, what kind of F and G are used in graph neural network? So what kind of F and G are used will vary the types of graph neural network. So whenever new graph neural network model are proposed, they're proposing new format of F and G. So this is skeleton of the graph neural network. So let me give an example, what kind of F and G are used in the field. The first paper, which start all this GNN boom, is a graph commercial network. And they use mean for the aggregation operation. So they merely just averaging my embedding and my neighboring embedding to compute the message vector. And for their transformation operation, they use one layer MLP. Just multiply with the transformation matrix and then pass to the nonlinear unit, which usually we use ReLU. And then it will output the node embedding. And another famous paper, graph isoformic network, they use the MLP uh, for transformation operation just before, but just like uh, the previous method. But here, not instead of averaging, they use sum. And now you could think, okay, that's a very small change. What is the contribution of this paper? I will talk about this paper later and I will like explain why they choose summation. But now just like uh, remember like uh, uh, people uh, use different format for F and G. And in the simplified GCN, uh, they uh, use average as graph conversion network did. And for the transformation part, they remove nonlinearity. And they say GNN is strong enough, even though uh, we do not use nonlinearity. So, so far, this tree shaped graph is showing how we compute the node embedding for node A. But we want to compute node embedding for node B and C and D, E, F. And to compute each node embedding, we need to make their own tree shaped graph, which is composed of neighboring node. So we're gonna uh, call this tree shaped graph composed of, uh, composed of neighboring node as a computation graph. So this is computation graph for node A. This is computation graph for node B. And this is computation graph for node C. So whenever you want to compute the node embedding using GNN, the first thing you need to do is make the computation graph and then you run GNN on it like this. But here, this uh, neural network module is corresponding to the aggregation and transformation operation that I described before. And this will be shared across node. And we use different parameters per layer, but you can use same parameters between layers, but it just, you just like lose the expressive power of GNN. So in common, like people use, do not share across layer, but they share parameters across node. Do you have any questions so far? Okay. And as other deep learning methods do the batch execution, GNN can also do the batch execution. So let's say we want to compute the node embedding of node A, B, C at the same time by setting 
uh, batch size as three. And to do that, we just uh, need to change the equation over there. So equation here, it was denoted, the, uh, it is the graph conversion network uh, equation that we average the node embedding and then pass over to the one layer MLP. And we're gonna change this equation to just a matrix multiplication format. So the thing change is we're gonna use node attribute matrix, just concatenation of node attribute. And instead of this uh, expression, we're gonna use adjusted matrix format. So here you see adjusted matrix is added with the identity matrix. And this show the same effect as combine the self node uh, embedding. So in aggregation operation, I show that we are aggregating not only neighboring node embedding, but also take care of my own embedding because my node attribute is most informative for myself. So this buying a multi, uh, by summing up with identity metrics, you could see the same effect. And this tilde denotes the low normalization of adjusted metrics. And this will bring the same effect as the averaging over the neighbors. So maybe you could not understand like at the first glance, but if you think thoroughly, you can understand. If you cannot understand, I'll just come to me after the class. So this is how we compute the graph neural network, the node embedding using graph neural network in batch, uh, in batch wise. And the thing you need to keep in mind is this node attribute matrix and adjusted matrix uh, is not the original one. So that means, let's think about, I want to compute my node embedding in my Instagram. And Instagram have billions of users there. So original adjusted matrix and node attribute matrix is billion scale. But to compute my node attribute, I just need to look into my neighboring, like a few number of friends around me. I don't need like the remaining billions of nodes. So that means every time we compute batch execution, we're gonna subtract the sub matrix from this node embedding matrix and adjusted matrix composed of nodes which are actually participating in my uh, computation graph. So by doing that, uh, we can uh, <clears throat> compute graph neural network in a very efficient way. And just keep in mind that the H0 is an input node attribute, which are given to us, which is fixed. And A and I are fixed. This is graph structure given to us. And this W, is the transformation matrix of the one layer MLP. And this will be trained while, uh, when we train GNN. So by, by training this W, the node, node embedding HL will keep updated. And finally, uh, it will give a good node embeddings to us. So after compute this node embedding, what are we gonna do? There are four typical uh, downstream tasks. First is, node level prediction. First, we compute node embedding, and, get, and then we're gonna find the mapping between node embedding to a labels. The second type of downstream task is edge level prediction. We compute node embedding for D and E and comparing their node embedding and say D and R, E are related enough to be connected. And if they are similar, we're gonna make an edge between them. It will be used as a like friends recommendation in Twitter or like Instagram. And the third uh, downstream task is, could be the attribute level prediction. So because not many people write down like your information, for example, in LinkedIn, you didn't write down your university and this is the like mask attribute. And by looking into your neighbors, uh, we can guess which university you're going. And the final downstream task is graph level prediction. So what they do is first, we're gonna compute node embedding for each node. And then we're gonna sum up them and we're gonna make one graph representation using those node, in, uh, node embeddings. And using that graph representation, we're gonna predict the property of this whole graph. So that means in this downstream task, we are given a set of graphs. So on, like when I talk about like these three uh, downstream tasks, we can run them on a one big size graph, like a one Facebook graph one Instagram graph, one Amazon graph. But this part is uh, we're gonna make one graph representation for each graph 
So this task is happen with a set of graphs. So I'm going to uh, explain what kind of applications are using graph level prediction uh, in the next slide. So across this four downstream tasks, the most basic one is node level, and node level and graph level prediction. When I say basic, it means like a, uh, the other prediction, uh, other task could just uh, made by extending this node level and graph level prediction. So these two are most widely used application. So today uh, across my, uh, in this lecture, I will keep talking about these two tasks. So for the node classification task, we compute the node embedding for each, uh, each node. And then we're gonna map, uh, finding the mapping to a label. So on this uh, prediction task, we can, for example, in citation network, we can classify papers on the network, net, uh, Reddit network. We can uh, find the embedding for each post and cluster them into its like topic, what, what kind of topic its posts are talking about. And in Amazon co-purchase graph, uh, which is if two products are, are purchased frequently together, there is edge, that's the Amazon co-purchase graph. And we can classify product into categories like this is furniture or this is bathroom items like that. And for the graph level prediction, as I told you, we compute node embedding first, and then we're gonna uh, run the readout operation. So readout operation is kind of summarization operation. So here, uh, we commonly do not use complicated operation. We just use sum or average or mean and max pooling of all node embeddings appear in the graph. And then finally, one graph have one representation and using that representation, we can predict the property of the graph. So most widely used application in this graph level prediction task is, uh, is the molecule property prediction. So each molecule could be presented as a graph. So atom gonna be node and the chemical bond between atoms will be edges in the graph. So given a molecule, you compute the node embedding for each atom and you summarize them and you have one graph embedding for each molecule and you are given a set of molecule and then that's how you learn oh given this molecule i compute node i compute the graph embedding then i can predict the property of this molecule this is very widely used in biology and uh, chemistry right now so so far what we have talked is Graph neural network, what is the problem definition? The input is adjusting matrix, node attribute matrix, and some uh, labels of part, part of nodes. And then we want to find good node embeddings. And using those node embeddings, uh, we're gonna run like several different downstream tasks. And graph neural network is composed of several layers. And each layer is composed of aggregation operation and transformation operation. And you learn the concept of computation graph and batch execution. And also two most uh, common uh, application, node level and graph level prediction. So from now on, uh, we will look into what kind of research, open research questions in the, in the structure of graph neural network. So before going over, do you have any questions? Okay, so yeah. Um, I'm curious about the aggregation operation. It seems like the assumption so far is that any kind of connection is sort of equally valued or equally treated in um, aggregation. But I'm curious if, if there's there's more of a research in sort of understanding the difference between that connection and maybe having like you know, a few different connections that might actually enter a downstream model in different ways. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. So the question is that. Uh, we have various type of connection between our neighboring node and should we, can we regard them equally or maybe they could have different meaning, different impact on different applications. So that's a very good question because that's one of the open research question in this field and I'm gonna talk very soon. Yeah. So as I told you before, graph neural network is, uh, we aggregate from messages from neighbors and then we transform them 
and then we will update node embedding. And the natural question we come up with is, as uh, the student over there talk, first, should we aggregate all neighbors? Are all neighbors are informative for me? We said, oh, neighboring nodes are relevant to me. So I should aggregate to improve my node embedding. But I don't think all neighbors in my, for example, Instagram are informative to make better representation for myself. So that is the first question. And second question is here, we just look into two hope, but why you choose two hope? Why we can make three layer GNN? We can make like 10 layer GNN. Why you choose two layer GNN here? And the third question is, oh, you said we're gonna average or sum the neighboring uh, embeddings, but we can ask how, why should we choose average or summation? What is the best aggregation strategy for given my graph? So this three is the three uh, most significant deciding factor of graph neural network architecture. With which neighbor should we aggregate message from? That's how many hopes should we check? And aggregation, how should we aggregate messages from neighbors? So I'm gonna talk about each factor one by one and talk about the research question. So let's start with the width of graph neural network. So we can first think, why don't we just aggregate all neighbors? Maybe at least one neighbor will be helpful for me. But actually in real world graph, you could not do that because we're gonna have the neighbor explosion uh, problem. So as you can guess from the structure of the computation graph, the neighbor, the computation graph grows exponentially. Let's say I have 10 friends and I want to compute my node embedding using three layer GNN. So that means I need to look into 10 neighbors and 10 neighbors need, need look into their another 10 layers and they need to look into their another 10 uh, neighbors. And at the end, to compute my node embedding, I need to look into 1000 neighbors. And because you want to compute your own neighbors too, and you need to look into your own 10, uh, 1000 neighbors, you need to look into your own 1000 neighbors. It is very inefficient. And also in real, oh, okay. That's very good question. So in NLP, like uh, the given, like let's think about sentence. The length of sentence is fixed. And if it, you want to work with like very long sentence, at some point you need to concatenate because the size of the like input is fixed. So that's why you can play here because it's just like uh, increased linearly. But graph neural network, how the field is increasing exponentially. So that's why, uh, but still like uh, NLP also have problem like how to deal with longer and longer sequences. So it's a, a similar problem, but GNN people uh, say, because we are growing exponentially, it's more like a urgent problem in our side. Okay, so also in real world graph, there are hub nodes who are connected to a huge number of nodes. Last year in Instagram, the person who have the largest number of followers are Cristiano Ronaldo. He has 400 million followers. And let's say I follow him and I want to compute my node embedding in two layer GNN. That means I'm connected to 4 million users through Cristiano Ronaldo. So I need to look into 4 million nodes to compute my node embedding. This is like insane, like unreasonable. So that's why we could not like just merely aggregate all neighbors connected to me, but need to use sampling. So we're gonna remit the size of neighborhood and then sample the fixed number of neighbors. And by doing that, we can regulate the computation cost of the GNN. Then when we say sampling, we can categorize them into two ways. How are you gonna sample neighbors? First is random sampling. We're gonna give the same sampling probability to each neighbors. And second is important sampling. We're gonna assign different sampling probability per neighbors. So this graph stage paper was proposed first uh, across all this area because this one uh, uh, 
show that by sampling neighbors, we can fix the computation explosion problem in GNN. And after this paper, all these uh, line of pay, uh, research have been done and saying, okay, we see that sampling solve the computation inefficiency problem. Then can we sample in a smarter way? Can we actually use sampling to improve accuracy too? And this part, and for this important sampling, we can categorize them into two types based on which neighbors they want to value. So as uh, the, the student over there asked, the neighbors have different, uh, different attributes, they have different context. So this important sampling method should decide because important sampling means that I'm gonna give different importance to each neighbors. Then first thing they need to decide is which neighbors are important to me. And uh, before uh, our work passed, all previous work tried to minimize variance in sampling. So they give higher importance to neighbors who help to uh, minimize the variance in sampling. And our paper uh, published last year say that, no, 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 that's not the important thing. The neighbors we need to put more importance is actually who helped me to improve my node embedding. So finally improve the GNN performance. So this is the result of our work. As you can see, when we learn node classification tasks on seven different real world graphs, our method pass, which focusing on neighbors who help to maximize the GNN uh, performance show up to 10% higher accuracy than all previous sampling based methods, which just care about the variance in sampling. So this like a huge gap in accuracy happened because real world graphs are noisy. That means every connection in the graph have different meaning. So some connection will be more useful for my task. Some connection is meaningless for my task. So let's think about LinkedIn. When we use LinkedIn, we use it for the better job recommendation, but actual in, in real world, we're not only make connection with people who work in the same field. We also make connection with personal friends, family members who work in a totally different field. So if I make a job recommendation for you, I need to filter out those uninformative neighbors and only sample neighbors who are actually working in the same field with you. So help me to find better job for you. And also in real world, there are many frauders. I think you all experience in your Instagram or Twitter or like LinkedIn, there's like random people who try to make a lot of connection with people. And we also need to filter out them to make a better node embedding for you. So by uh, past, looking into the context of each connection and then uh, by filtering out those unuseful, like, like unuseful or noisy edges, we could see uh, the higher accuracy across all like sampling based methods. Do you have any question? So that is one open research question in the wit, which neighbor should we aggregate from message from? And next we will ask, how many hopes should we check? Maybe informative neighbors are not directly connected with me, but hidden in like two hopes or three hopes for me. Maybe they are hidden in the five hopes for me, but we don't know where exactly that informative neighbors are hidden. Then our natural thing, like thing is, why don't we just make a deep GNN? Then at least we will not miss the informative neighbors. But in real world, in many applications, the depth of the GNN is just two or three. And you guys are asking, hey, we're sitting in the deep learning class. You should provide a deep neural network, not this two or three layer shallow neural network. But unfortunately, GNN field use two or three layer neural network because as I told you before, we have neighbor explosion problem. So the, when each node have average K neighbors, and if, there are, if we are learning L layer GNN, the number of neighbors we need to look into per node is K to the L. So if L uh, become large, when the graph neural network become deep, more neighbors we need to look into. And this bring two uh, crucial problem. First is over smoothing. Second is over squashing. So over smoothing is, let's think in this way. 
I have my computation graph and I want to make 10 layer GNS. And I will look into all people connected within 10 hopes. And I have this big gra computation graph. And you also want to look into 10 hope computation graph, uh, like look into all neighbors within 10 hope. That means at some point, we're gonna share a lot of neighbors in our computation graph. But we, when, when I compute my node embedding, we're gonna summarize the new neighbors appeared in my computation graph. And if we share many neighbors in our computation graph, that means our final node embedding will be similar. And then at the end, the node embeddings become indistinguishable because every node share many neighbors in their computation graph. And if node embedding become indistinguishable, then we're gonna see a very low like accuracy in the node classification task and many more. So this paper uh, first define oversmoothing phenomenon in GNN, and they show the oversmoothing in a very simple, uh, small size graph. So this different color is uh, corresponding to the different class in this Karate Club network. And on the first and second layer, we could see like a different class of node embeddings are separate. But when we make GNN deeper and deeper, you could see at some point, node embeddings are all similar because they share many neighbors in their computation graph and their node embeddings become indistinguishable. And many research is going on here to solve this oversmoothing problem. And one method is Paranorm. How they mitigate oversmoothing is they keep the total pairwise squared distance as constant value. So when I say pair, like pairs of nodes, we can uh, categorize pairs of node in graph into two types. First is pairs, uh, their edges is happening in the edge. So the pairs of node connected in a graph and pairs of node disconnected in a graph. So when we learn GNN, because I aggregate node embedding from my neighbor and my neighbor aggregate node embedding from me. So our embedding will be look similar. So this red part decreasing. And because this method tried to fix this total sum of the square distance, this blue part will increase. And this blue part is this like node embeddings between these connected pairs. So by trying to maintain this as constant value, we could see the effect that the disconnected node embedding look dissimilar and mitigate the oversmoothing problem. So this is their result. Look at the dot line. This is the original CNN uh, performance. As you can see, at first, it show almost like 100% 100 accuracy. And when we make it deeper, you could see a sharp drop in accuracy because now node embeddings are all similar. We cannot like uh, predict anything from this like indistinguishable node embeddings. And when we use paranorm technique, we could mitigate the oversmoothing, but still it goes down. So this is one open research question that how can we uh, maintain the accuracy by uh, while make GNN deep and deep. Let's move to the second uh, problem, over squashing. So this is also happened due to the deep uh, GNN, but it has different impact. So this happened because when we make deep GNN, we are gonna have large computation graph and there are a lot of neighbors in my computation graph. And I want to summarize all of them in a fixed size of node embedding. So that's why we call it over squashing. We squash too much information onto a fixed uh, size of node embedding. And what happened is, even though one of nodes are informative for me, because I summarize them with uninformative neighbors too, so the, inf the good information is diluted by uninformative nodes. That's what we call over squashing. So the pay, this paper defined over squashing and uh, over squashing uh, existence in GNN by providing this uh, simple toy example. So this, uh, their toy example is, we want to compute the node embedding for this node and they hide the hint here. So when we aggregate information from this uh, leaf node, which contain hidden, uh, which contain hint, we can make good node embeddings. So that means 
GNN should be at least this step to get the hint and make good node embeddings. And they then they make this tree deeper and deeper. And to get this hint, GNN should be deeper and deeper. And as you can see, when the hint are farther away from the target node and GNN should be deeper and deeper, you could see a sharp decrease in accuracy. So this is also happening because of the deep GNN. And that's why uh, still like this is an open research question. And that's why there are not many deep GNN in the real world. And this foundational paper say, you know what? The reason that we are suffer from over squashing and over smoothing is because we mix two concepts. There are actually two different concepts of depths in GNN. And so far we mix them. That's why we are suffering this problem. That two concept is first, depth one is neighborhood. How much I'm gonna look into for my neighbors. And the second depth is the number of layers in GNN. So far, how I explain GNN to you is I mix these two concepts. How much I'm gonna look into my neighbors will decide the depth of the GNN. And this paper say, no, we need to decouple them. Then first, we're gonna decide neighborhood by, setting the, by deciding that's one. And after uh, extract the computation graph from the uh, small neighborhood from the graph, we're gonna learn a deep GNN. So now, because the, like, as you asked before, in NLP sequence is fixed size. So after we make the size of node participate in the computation graph fixed, we can make GNN deep, like 10 or 20 layer GNN. So this is how they try to solve and uh, solve the, try to propose the deep GNN, but actually they, maybe you could, few of them could notice, they didn't solve the principal question that for here, what if the eight is the informative neighbors? How should we include them in this subgraph? So, because this, this is gonna be the playground for this deep neural network here. And that means at least the input from zero to seven should be informative. At least they should contain the most important informative neighbors. So this is a, a open research question right now that how can we find good neighborhood so we can run deep GNN all over them. So, so far, how we compute this sampling is just heuristically, like uh, compute the personalized page rank and then pick the nodes who have highest uh, personalized page rank and then make a subgraph and then run deep GNN over that. But we want to uh, sample the, this neighborhood more smart way. That is the uh, open question in this field. So, so far we have talked about how many hopes should we uh, check? And let's move to the aggregation strategy. How should we aggregate messages from neighbors? So as I told you before, GNN is composed of several layers and each layer we will learn two operations. First is aggregation operation. Second is transformation operation. And here, uh, the topic is which F we're gonna use. So as I told you, the first paper, uh, we're gonna use F as just averaging the node embeddings. And GNN also borrowed the attention concept. So we compute, we, uh, we compute different weights per neighbors by computing the like relevance between target node and its neighbors. And then we're gonna run the weighted sum. So buying like a while some papers keep proposing the new aggregation strategy, people start to ask a principal question. Let's look at the GNN equation again. It's composed of two operations. And this transformation operation, any neural network module can fit in. And we commonly use one layer MLP. And that means this is not the core part of GNN. The core part make GNN as graph neural network, not just one part of deep neural, uh, deep neural network is aggregation operation. By having aggregation operation, GNN can process graph structure. So people think 
the power of GNN comes from power of aggregation strategies. So to find the best aggregation strategy, we need to measure the power of GNN. And when we find the like maximal power GNN, we can look into the which aggregation strategy they use, and then that's gonna be the optimal aggregation strategy for us. Then your question is gonna be, but what is the power of GNN? How can we measure it? So this seminal paper, how powerful are graph neural network? Say, uh, we're gonna measure GNN's power by giving two non-isoformic graphs, which means uh, they have different graph structure. Two, like, uh, two graphs which have different structure. We ask GNN and whether they can check whether they can give different graph representation to different graph. So this is graph level prediction task. Two graphs are given. For each graph, you're gonna compute node embedding. You're gonna summarize them and pick up one representation for each graph and you're gonna compare them. And if they are different for different graphs, we're gonna say, oh, GNN is powerful enough to distinguish these two graphs. So like, let's think about this simple tour example. Among these three graphs, two are identical, one is different. So at first, like we think, no, they're all different. But actually, when you look into uh, carefully, if I like uh, unfold them, they are just one line of graph. So these two are just one line of graph, while this graph is different from them. So their task is, we're gonna uh, like give very confusing, hard task of uh, hard uh, like a uh, set of graphs, and then we ask GNN can give the different graph embedding for us or not. So this paper, what they found out that is any aggregation based GNN is at most as powerful as weiss feller lehmann test. I will not go too deeply about what is this test, but just like you can think, this is a old, uh, old graph methodology uh, invented in 1968. Uh, and this is like just methodology, methodology to distinguish two non-isoformic graphs. So the contribution of this paper is that while like uh, this is this old methodology, which were invented in 1968, this made connection to the recently hot graph neural network and say the power of graph neural network is at most as powerful as this old graph methodology. So that's the contribution of this paper. And what they say, I would not like uh, go deeply and like tell you the theoretical analysis they did, but the main uh, takeaway you can get from this paper is to have the maximum power from GNN, the aggregation strategy should be injective. So injective definition is like this. And they say, one example of injective aggregation strategy is summation. So that's why, do you remember at the beginning when I introduced the different type of graph structure, I say at first graph commercial network is averaging the node embedding. And the second, they sum up the node embedding. And actually they have their own like very, a grounded argument why they should choose summation. So why we need to choose summation over mean is summation is injective while mean is not. So look at this toy example. If we learn mean on these two graphs, this will output one blue, this will output one blue. But if I learn uh, summation here, it will output two blue, it will output three blue. And also similar here, if we learn like a mean or max, they will output the same, like one green, one red, also one green, one red. But when I when we learn some aggregation over these two graphs, this will output one green, one red, two green, two red. So that's how summation is more expressive than mean or max. Okay. Yeah, that's very good question. So uh, actually, uh, so I didn't introduce, but to uh, show this theoretically that uh, the aggregation strategy should be injective, the assumption they make is the features are from countable universe. So that means uh, we're gonna like regard them as like an integer number. So there is no average or summation. When we, uh, to show this power of the GNN, we uh, work on that assumption. So, but, 
we show like even this assumption summation is powerful so we can generalize to a real value node attributes uh, scenario too so after this paper this becomes super active area one of the largest uh, area right now in GNN they try to make more powerful GNN than this WL test because this paper said that current design of GNN is the most powerful of this WL test and many papers are asked can we design new graph neural network model which are powerful than the WL test and I'm going to introduce a few papers and their intuition so first paper what they did is they give random features to each node so by giving like random features the like random colors to node maybe we can distinguish two like non isoformic graph more easily and this paper say no let's not use random features let's use the graph structure which are given to us so they heuristically extract some subgraph uh, features and then augment uh, its node features and this paper say no uh, let's cha like change our perspective of aggregation we're not just looking into the directly connected neighbors why don't we make direct connection to my two or three hopes neighbor and aggregate them at the same time maybe this will help us to uh, more expressive and distinguish two non-isoformic graph and this paper say no let's change aggregation uh, uh, perspective again so we're, let's not just look into my directed connect, directly connected neighbors but let's look into the interaction uh, among them so by looking into how my directly connected neighbors are interacted to each other maybe we can understand more so so far many approaches keep like proposing oh this is better like more powerful this is more powerful gnn uh structure uh this paper say oh no we theoretically proves that there is no a clear single winner aggregator if you want to make a like stronger gnn you should use a set of aggregators. There's no single winner aggregator which will outperform the WL test. So why like many research are going on here to find what is the optimal aggregation strategy in GNN? Another, another field ask, raise a question to our assumption because at the beginning I say, GNN tried to aggregate embedding from my neighboring nodes because we assume the connected nodes are informative, relevant. But what if it's not? What if the graph are in a graph, the nodes are connected with nodes who have different class label and dissimilar features? So this is also active area and graph. How can we deal with this heterophilous network? Like the do the graph conversion network still work well on this heterophilous network or not. So, so far I have talked about the graph neural network architecture, then three crucial deciding factor. Then the practitioner who want to use GNN for their application gonna say, okay, I could see you have done a lot of research in this field, but I need one graph structure. I need one graph conversional structure to learn my application. I could not like read all those paper and pick the best one for my application. Then uh, this is also one field in GNN um, which called neural architecture search for GNN. So th what they do is they find proper weight, depth and aggregation strategy for a given uh, users, a given graph and task automatically. So this is also proposed by us. And what they do is we define a hyperparameter space composed of the deciding factor, uh, design factor of graph uh, neural network architecture, like a dimension of message, the number of neighbors we're gonna aggregate, the hoop and the aggregation strategy, and uh, what kind of nonlinearity we're gonna use. And after they define the, uh, we define the hyperparameter space, we explore the space efficiently, uh, borrowing like reinforcement learning uh, techniques. And then by doing that, we can propose new graph, uh, new graph neural network uh, method, which have different weight depth aggregation strategy and nonlinearity from conventional graph neural network algorithm. So here the black one is existing graph methodology. 
uh, which are proposed in the published paper. And this uh, colored OTOGN123 is new graph uh, neural network stru structure finding for specific user scenario. So, so far we talk about the open research question in GNN architecture. How can we de decide the architecture of a GNN? And the next question, like after we got the good like architect proper architecture of GNN to us, the next thing we need to solve is how we're going to train them. The most common way to train GNN is semi supervised learning. The input nodes, the input attributes are all given so for all nodes, and only a subset of only a subset of nodes are labeled. And this is the most common scenario to uh, train GNN. And because label Finding labeling is so hard. Uh, there is also unsupervised learning uh, technique in, to train GNN. And they use the constructive learning technique. What is that is uh, first given the original graph, original node attribute X, original address matrix A, we compute the node embeddings using GNN. And we corrupt that graph. We can like uh, remove edges or add edges to between the random pairs of node, and we can swap node attribute and like we crop the graph, and then we compute the node attribute. And what we're gonna do is we try to make them as dissimilar as possible. So by doing that, we can train GNN. And also there is a transfer learning technique to train GNN. So for example, there are two pair of graphs which are independent. And if one graph like Facebook network has enough labels, we train GNN on here using their labels. And then we pass the pre-trained GNN to this another graph. And using this trained GNN, we can compute node embeddings and then we can use that node embedding to run application on this second graph. So this transfer learning is from graph to another graph. And another type of transfer learning is transfer knowledge within one graph. So so far, I have talked about homogeneous graph. So homogeneous graph is graph composed of same type of nodes and same type of edges. So Instagram, the nodes are all users and the edges are follow or followed, like follows or be followed. But in real world, there are more like a heterogeneous graphs than homogeneous graph. So heterogeneous graph is composed of different types of nodes and different type of edges. And let's think about like YouTube. In YouTube, there are video users and channels. They're all different type of nodes and they are connected by different type of edges. User, subscribe channel, channel on nodes video, user, like or dislike video. So whole YouTube thing could be presented as a heterogeneous graph. Like this is the Amazon pro uh, product network this is also heterogeneous graph. There are the, our product and there are users. I buy product, I write review, and this review describes this product. So in real world, in big tech company, usually they have one big heterogeneous graph, then like uh, several number of like homogeneous graph. And this, uh, pay, what, did, uh, what we did on this heterogeneous graph is some node types, we have many labels. For example, videos in YouTube or product in Amazon. We can access to their information because they just write down in the URL, like in their web page. But for users, because of privacy issue, we could not access the user's information. So our idea is, can we train a model on the node types which we, where we have free access and then transfer the model to a node type which we cannot access the information. So here, the transfer learning happened between node types on one heterogeneous graph. So, so far today, what we talk is, what is a graph neural network and open research question in GNN architecture and how we're gonna train those GNN. And before wrap up this lecture, let me introduce arguably one of the most popular success story of GNN applications. That is a MoQ classification. As I told you before, one molecule 
could be represented as a graph where node is atom and the uh, edge are bones between them. And if put features will be atom type and charge and bone type. And we're going to design a graph level prediction on this a set of molecule, a set of graphs that uh, for each molecule, we compute graph representation. And using that graph representation, we're going to run a binary classification, whether this molecule is helpful to prevent a certain disease or not. So that's how they can find the potent drug. Given a molecule, first compute node embedding for each atom, summarize them, make one graph representation, and using that representation, predict the property of its molecule. So buying, uh, then like uh, they learn on a large data set of known candidate molecules, and they picked up 100 candidates, which are highly likely to be a drug. Uh, we, and this cell paper passed uh, this <clears throat> top, top candidate to the chemistry, and they investigate whether it could be a drug or not. And actually, this paper found a highly a potent antibiotic, which previously overlooked in, the, in this biology field. So this is a groundbreaking discovery that we solve a hard biology question using GNN. So this, ha like, this has aroused a huge attention across uh, many media. Like, uh, this is uh, published in Cell, and Nature also talk about it, like BBC, like Finan Financial Times all talk about it here. They say using AI, but actually what they use is GNN. So this like uh, make many people like put more attention to GNN. Okay, what is GNN? How could you solve this biology problem? So this is just one uh, part of GNN's application. And I believe there are many more open problems and many problems are underexplored so far. So if you could like uh, invent a good GNN model, because graphs are everywhere, you can make like huge impact across wider a range of applications. So I hope today you learn about the concept of GNN and maybe you could be interested in GNN or you can apply GNN in your own research field. And yeah, and if you have any idea or, or question about GNN, like always uh, welcome to like email me or you can just come to me and ask questions. So thank you for listening. And is there any questions? Okay, yeah. so thank you. And if you have any questions, like you can come down and ask me. Thank you. <laughs>